Good afternoon. So uh, I'm Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor Ralph Hexter, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth event in the 2018-19 season of UC Davis Forums on the Public University and Social Good. The UC Davis Forums was established in 2012 and presents about a half dozen lectures each academic year by experts from a range of disciplines. The series was designed to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public on the following subjects. The major challenges facing the public university, ways of responding to those challenges, and how the public university is evolving with an ultimate goal of helping to produce a public university that will best serve society and individuals, this series poses the following questions, or at least some of them. What should and can the public university be in the 21st century? In our preceding five uh, seasons, the UC Davis Forums has presented distinguished speakers on a wide range of topics pertaining to the public university and the social good, including educational access and affordability, diminishing public confidence in and funding for public universities, the economic impact of UC campuses on their regions, sexism in the academy, and the relationship between the academic mission and neoliberal, excuse me, metrics of success, among many others. I invite you all to visit the series website, forums.ucdavis.edu, to find information about all this season's events as well as videos of our past events. This afternoon, we're delighted to welcome Elizabeth L. Hillman, the 14th president of Mills College. She will speak on the topic, Captain Marvel and 21st Century Women's Colleges. Her topic will be on women's colleges as champions of social justice. We'll have a proper speaker introduction shortly, but before that, as is my custom, I'd like to set the stage for what, uh, for that introduction with a few thoughts. While the UC Davis Forums has addressed a fairly large constellation of topics, including gender issues in the academy, it is not yet focused on the important subject of women's colleges or journey to a whole different universe, until today, that is. In fact, it's an open question as to what will happen when, in keeping with our vow of our new UC Davis strategic plan to boldly go, we plunge into the fantastical Marvel universe that is the jumping off point for Dr. Hillman's lecture. We will encounter much that is unfamiliar, but nothing, I think, that our series warp drive and deflector shields can't handle. There's good reason to expect that the journey will be a rewarding one. Doctor, I should really say President Hillman's thoughts on how her college can cre create new alliances to more effectively pursue social justice goals, including educational equity for women and girls, will be useful to all higher ed institutions, especially those that, like UC Davis, have a public service mission and a strong commitment to promoting an inclusive and just society. More generally, her remarks will help us to clarify our own ideas about how work for social justice fits into the larger higher educational enterprise. For my final thought, let me acknowledge the creative approach that President Hillman has taken for her UC Davis Forums lecture. Given her own college's celebrated embrace of independent thinking, creativity, and social and cultural engagement, it's entirely fitting that she would be able to see and choose to convey the real world relevance, wisdom, and inspirational potential she finds in the story of Captain Marvel. On a personal note, I'll share with you that I admire President Hillman as an intrepid adventurer herself. I first got to know her as one of my fellow travelers in LGBTQ presidents in higher education and became an acolyte at once. Not only fearless, but also generous in the tradition of heroes running back at least as far as Homer. She has also this year been a mentor to one of our faculty, Professor of English Department Chair John Marks, hosting him at Mills College as an ACE Fellow, where ACE stands for American Council on Education. It's not a reference to daring pilots in this or any future universe. For all those reasons, I afford Dr. Hillman superhero status herself, and like you, eagerly await her presentation. Now, before she's introduced, a few thank yous and announcements. I'd First of all, I'd like to thank all who have made the event possible. The UC Davis Forum Steering Committee, led by Martin Kenny, Professor of Human and Community Development, and also our moderator for this event, Lisa Matterson, Associate Professor of History. One more announcement. After today's presentation, uh, there will be a Q&A period and then a reception in this location. We hope that you can all stay for the talk. 
and the refreshments. Now, Professor Matterson. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to see everybody here today, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Hillman. Dr. Hillman is the 14th president of Mills College, an independent liberal arts college for women and gender non-binary undergraduate students with graduate programs for students of all genders located in Oakland, California. She's a scholar of history and law. She received her Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Duke University, a Master's in History from the University of Pennsylvania, and a JD and PhD uh, uh, from Yale University. Her extensive experience in higher education has taken her to prestigious institutions around the United States. Prior to coming to Mills College, Dr. Hillman was the provost and academic dean at the University of California Hastings College of Law. She served as a professor of law and director of faculty development at Rutgers University School of Law. And she taught at Yale University and the US Air Force Academy, and she was also an officer in the US Air Force, where she served as a space operations officer and orbital analyst. Dr. Hillman is an expert on issues of sexual violence and gender equity, particularly in the military. She has testified before Congress and national commissions, including on issues related to non-consensual pornography in the US military, and served on an independent panel chartered by Congress to make recommendations about sexual assault in the military. She was appointed to serve on a blue ribbon study group, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee addressing sexual harassment in the science, engineering, and medical workplace, and it released a path-breaking report in 2018 on its findings. Dr. Hillman has brought her expertise in higher education, administration, and women's and gender issues to multiple other arenas, and I will just name a few more of many. She serves on the board of the Women's Colleges Coalition, is a member of the NCAA Division III Chancellors and Presidents Advisory Group, and is a founding member of the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration. And we are so delighted to welcome her here today to hear her discuss the ways women's colleges can continue to champion social justice in the 21st century. So thank you, and please welcome, invite, welcome <laughs> Dr. Hillman. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, and um, thank you all for welcoming me to the Provost uh, series and this forum. It's a great pleasure to be at a, a forum sponsored by one of uh, the people who's been an inspiration to so many of us across higher education. So I'm grateful, Ralph, for your kind words, your intergalactic aspirations, and <laughs> And the fact that um, Davis is interested in a little place like Mills, which is just not so far away. I also want to give a shout out to one of your own here, John Marks, who we've had the great pleasure of hosting at Mills over the last year, and it's been a great learning opportunity for us at Mills, so I appreciate that. Um, so this is, uh, I don't want to oversell the Marvel Comics part of this, um, but I do, I do want to share with you why I used this as a convenient uh, frame for what I'd like to share with you. How many of you saw the movie, the Captain Marvel movie? Oh, excellent. Almost no one. Okay, so you're completely beholden to me to explain what I'm talking about. So um, the, uh, what I, I, this is the first, this was released on International Women's Day in March of this year, this movie. It's the first time the Marvel superheroes franchise has had a woman in the lead role of, uh, of this. Honestly, were I to bring this up to speed, I would probably have to point you towards the new uh, movie vehicle that Sophie Turner is starring in. Have you seen this? So Sophie Turner, who is the um, maybe the breakout star of Game of Thrones, played Sansa Stark in Game of Thrones. She's headed off to a new X-Men movie that's to be released in June um, that some people have said should be called X-Women. Um, and this is an example of the superhero genre actually encompassing not so much, I'm afraid, us in higher education, but actually a different set of aspirations um, around gender and equity, and also a different sense of what's possible um, for different previously disenfranchised and marginalized groups. And that's true in the Captain Marvel vehicle. It's also true certainly in the X-Men series and in the new version of, of the, the X-Men movie that will have a female star for the first time. Uh, so I... 
I used Captain Marvel here because I think that one of the catchphrases that came out of that movie is instructive. When Captain Marvel, who was suffering the amnesia that so often happens in superhero movies, <laughs> um, encountered persons from her past, including a young girl. The young girl recognized her, but Captain Marvel did not, who was not yet Captain Marvel, did not recognize this young girl. And she said to the, the girl, she said, I'm not who you think I am. Well, I think that's true for women's colleges today. Um, in fact, soon to be Captain Marvel was who that young girl remembered her to be. And she recognized her capacities only when she reconciled that past with the, the present that she was actually now saddled with and eventually to break out of. And I think that's really true for us in higher education too. For women's colleges and for small liberal arts colleges, we are in a threatened sector of higher education because of the choices of students, the concerns about the payoff of higher education investment, and because of the, uh, the financial dynamics of trying to maintain the expensive capital infrastructure that's required for a higher education program with the relatively small number of students that we serve and the fact that increasingly we serve students with, uh, with every bit as much financial need as students who are attending other institutions. So that sort of challenge is, is, is upon Mills College and other institutions and I hope that what I have to say about that will be useful to you as you think about uh, my own sector of higher ed right now, small colleges, but also about places like UC Davis. So these are a few pictures of who Mills used to be. Um, there are some pictures from Mills Deep Past, uh, founded in 1852. Uh, it moved to Oakland in, in 1871 and started to grant bachelor's degrees around that time. We just had our 131st commencement exercises last weekend. The women at Mills um, back then don't look like the women at Mills right now. And in fact, not all are women. One of the changes at Mills has been a move towards gender equity to recognize the non-binary nature of gender. And Mills was the first of the women's colleges to adopt a transgender inclusive undergraduate admissions practice, a practice that actually has been followed by just about every women's college, including many faith-based women's colleges where that was a steeper climb, honestly, than it was at Mills. There's also, I'll note in the, um, in the bottom corner there, some of the signs uh, that accompanied the protest of maybe the most historic decision at Mills College, which was a decision to overturn the Board of Trustees um, mandate that the college move to being co-educational. That happened in 1990. Um, just in case you're thinking about the weather for your own commencement, apparently 1990 is the last time it rained on commencement at Mills. It rained this last weekend. I'm not sure what to make of that. So, um, But in 1990, the board and the administration decided to open their undergraduate admissions to all genders, and that, um, that came to a complete halt. The students and, and alumni took over the campus, and the decision was reversed a short time later. So this is more who we are today a picture from a sunnier commencement than we had on Saturday morning. Um, also some pictures from who our student body is today. Among our undergraduates, we have about 60% students of color, many under, from underrepresented groups. We have upwards of a third first generation college students. We have upwards of 95% who qualify for financial aid. We have a very different population than we used to. We have about half Pell eligible students. So the students that Mills is serving reflect the students that the independent college sector in general is serving with a particular tilt that the Bay Area um, supports and our geographic location supports. We also have about half of our students who self-identify as LGBTQ or other. So we have a very diverse uh, student body. We also have a very diverse faculty. I'll share more about that with you a little later. We're one of 37 institutions that are members of the Women's College Coalition. Not every one of those is a women's college that has a restrictive undergraduate uh, admissions uh, practice, but many of them are. And the, the different um, uh, logos up there give you a sense of the wide range. There are some very highly selective uh, institutions that are on that list. There are also some institutions that are regional uh, universities and colleges, and, and some that are embedded within larger institutions but re retain an identity that's related to their history as a women's college. We also have uh, not only the Women's College Coalition as potential partners in advancing women's, uh, women focused education, but also worldwide coalition partners. And my theme here is to talk to you about partnerships across higher education. You no doubt have heard this if you thought uh, um, many partnerships are happening here at UC Davis, but every institution is reaching outside of its, its gates in order to have community partners and other institutions whose goals they share. 
This is an example of some of the institutions that share Mill's commitment to gender and racial equity and to the advancement of educational opportunities for girls and women. And I'll just point to you that among the sustainable development goals that motivate international uh, humanitarian aid, the education of women and girls is very high on that list. And if you talk to folks who are interested in elevating equity and justice around the world, educating women and girls, which is what Mills is all about, has long been uh, central to other, other specific economic goals. So let me talk to you some about local coalition partners too. When you think about the range of institutions that we might work with to advance our mission at Mills, which is a mission that's about education and about gender equity, these are all systems and institutions that share that goal. Now we as colleges and universities can't succeed without K through 12 partners. And in fact, uh, right at, uh, at Mills, which is in Oakland, I don't know if any of you have um, children who are in the um, public school system, but yesterday there were a lot of kids in my office. There was in fact um, the daughter of one of our um, college officers who was with us during our college officer meeting yesterday morning, and my kids were home from school too, because so many teachers headed to Sacramento to protest the, the level of investment by the state of California in our public schools. And right where Mills is, in fact in Oakland, we had a seven day teacher strike uh, this spring, echoing the strikes that are happening in many other places. There is a crisis in K through 12 education and it definitely has an impact on our campuses too. At the same time, we need to embrace the partners who are working in those schools. We have a school of education that trains teachers and leaders um, in those schools, and many Mills graduates are working in public schools across the Bay Area and other schools. So those matter tremendously. It's not only public schools that we work with either, or not only the standard public schools, public charter schools, as well as private institutions, and those matter tremendously to Mills being able to meet its goals. I also put up community colleges and public universities, and here to our um, stated theme, public universities. Mills needs to complement the strengths of public universities that are around us in the Northern California higher educational ecosystem in particular, but really across the state and across the country. There are some things that research universities can do better than a small college like Mills, but there are things that a small college like Mills can do better than research universities. By trying to identify those and work together, we can, we can advance those partnerships. Cities, counties, and the state, this matters tremendously to us. Our infrastructure is tremendous. Mills has its own garbage truck. We, um, we have a 135 acre campus that we seek to maintain. We have a tremendous amount of physical plant need and upkeep that we need to do on that, in, in that space, and much of it is tied to the city. Among the things that college presidents deal with that I wouldn't have put on that list before, right now there's a sewer uh, lateral check of our entire campus. We have a, a, a temporary sewer line running through the creeks that, not in the creeks, but a line, um, <laughs> an actual uh, you know, temporary 10 inch pipe that runs through the campus that sends all the waste from the communities around us and from mills through this magic sewage treatment truck that sits on a corner of the campus and then uh, heads over to, um, to, uh, 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 process, um, to the processing plant uh, once every three or four days. Like these are the infrastructure challenges that we have to sustain. I have a very small student body for these kinds of extensive challenges and that's partly why we need to work with the city, with the county and with the state to drive resources where possible and make sure we're working to meet the needs of the neighborhoods around us as well. Uh, I have a couple other slides on these other points. So here's some of the foundation partners that we have, just to give you a sense of the sorts of grants that you all write for from an R1 that is like uh, UC Davis and the other UCs, other great UC institutions. We also reach out to some of those primary partners. We have some smaller foundations that support us as well. Um, the Mellon Foundation is an example of a grant we were very excited to receive this year. We, um, we asked a few times for different we floated different ideas with the Mellon Foundation, but we were especially excited that they, they, wanted, to, they wanted us to focus on working with Oakland artists, um, spoken word artists, performance artists, poets, to talk about uh, the, the kind of exciting work that was happening in Oakland that we could bring to our campus. Now Mills is right in Oakland, it's in East Oakland in a neighborhood that ranges from affluent uh, areas to quite challenged areas economically, and we felt like the Mellon Foundation supporting Mills in Oakland made, would make a tremendous difference in terms of our arts and humanities programs in particular. And these other foundations have all supported Mills in different ways over the, uh, over the past year. 
These are some of our K through 12 partners. I put up there in the top right Mills Teacher Scholars because that's an example of a grant funded program in our School of Education that really matters to the community around us. It's actually not a degree that we grant. It's instead support that our scholars at Mills uh, provide to teachers and scholars in Bay Area uh, uh, K through 12 system. And they, those teachers get, get access to best teaching practices, a sense of community, professional development opportunities through that program. And that elevates Mills' ability to impact that K through 12 system. I also put up there the Oakland Promise. Mills' efforts to work with the Oakland Promise and other Promise programs, which are intended to increase the college going rates of high school students. Oakland itself was particularly challenged. Um, when the Oakland Promise was launched some three years ago, uh, it would, the numbers of students who would actually attend college who started in ninth grade um, and would graduate six years after college was one in 10 students. The numbers were terrifyingly low. So the commitment was to triple that. Mills has helped to do that in part by changing our tuition. So one of the big changes we made last year was to reduce our tuition by 36%. We call this a tuition reset because our tuition had gotten very high and our tuition discount rate had gotten very high. It meant that the published sticker price of an education at Mills had very little resemblance to what it actually cost most students to attend Mills. So we reset our tuition and reset our aid with an effort to recognize we couldn't expect to generate more revenue per student um, on the same metrics that we were in the past and we needed to to develop more student pipelines attract more students but also attract and and build different revenue streams to replace some of that tuition that we wouldn't any longer get from students who were increasing not, increasingly not able to pay the full cost of their education so the Oakland Promise enabled us to triple the number of students from the Oakland Unified um, School District, working with a local nonprofit, the East Bay um, uh, Scholarship Fund, the East Bay Community Foundation that supported a scholarship fund. And then the school district I mentioned, the Julia Morgan School for Girls, that's an interesting um, historical connection for Mills. Mills was the site of some of uh, architect Julia Morgan, who was the first woman to be admitted to the American Institute of Architects. We were the site of some of her early very important buildings. We have six, we had initially six buildings on the Mills campus that Julia Morgan designed and built. Four of them still stand. Um, one of them was the first reinforced concrete structure west of the Mississippi. One of them is a, um, a school that is now the Julia Morgan School for Girls. It's a private middle school for girls that's on our campus. So those are the kinds of partnerships where we have a long-term ground lease with a congruent mission uh, that we can bring to our campus that can enable us to increase our impact and actually use the space that we have in, in, in ways that make us more sustainable and also support our goals. These are some of our university partners. Maybe we'll get Davis on this list before long. Um, right now, your uh, friends in Berkeley, I can talk a little bit about that in the bottom right. So UC Berkeley has long been a partner of Mills because of our physical proximity. And Mills has cross-enrollment arrangements with UC Berkeley. We've also made it easier to, um, to do some of the things that had happened in the past, not only making cross-enrollment a little bit easier, but also allowing Berkeley students to live on our campus. So we have some excess housing capacity on our campus, whereas UC Berkeley is very taxed in terms of housing its students. So we have had Berkeley students living on the Mills campus the past few years. We also set up a task force to meet on a regular basis that includes a trustee of Mills, an associate provost from Mills, and the vice chancellor for undergraduate education from UC Berkeley, along with other key people to talk about how we might collaborate more effectively. I'll tell you, I'm excited about the possibilities of it, and I see how hard it is to move big institutions quickly. Mills is relatively small. We're relatively nimble. We have an imperative, um, an urgency uh, to move. It's hard to move large institutions where the numbers of students being affected, the scale is really so different than the kinds of scale that we're talking about at Mills. So that task force has great potential, and I've been very appreciative of the support of Chancellor Carol Christ and, and Kathy Koshlin, who's the Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education. And yet, to really build programs that would send students back and forth more often has proved more challenging than we thought initially. Uh, we continue to think about a STEM leadership initiative where Berkeley and Mill students could work together to counter some of the challenging numbers in STEM fields, for instance, for women's success, especially women of color's success in those STEM fields. But right now, uh, that's, uh, that's more in prospect than it is in, in, in uh, full-fledged development. These others, a lot of community colleges. Where we have seen enrollment gains in the last two years has been in enrollments of community college students. This is in part because we have to do this because the California State Legislature has told us that they will maintain the grants that students coming to private colleges and universities can get at the same level if we admit more associate degree transfer students, meaning we get more students to degrees 
Why? Because California cares about closing that gap between the number of students who are graduating and the number of students with degrees that the economy demands. That's a big challenge. For us to be able to do that, we need to admit more community college students. The biggest barrier to this has been the clarity of time to degree and mapping the number of the courses and the work that students do at a variety of different community colleges onto our own curriculum. That is a labor intensive task that our faculty has to lead and they've done a great job in many different majors of doing this. But I'll tell you, if those of you who have worked on this, this is not for the faint of heart. And students want crystal clarity on exactly how long it will take them to get to a degree based on what they've earned to a certain point. Now, when we get to the point, maybe in some of our lives, when blockchain is the order of the day and we can all plug our credentials into a system and understand what, 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 mean, what something at one institution translates to at another institution, we'll be in a different place. But right now, we're not in that place. And so this is an intensive process of reviewing exactly um, what students come in with and what they need to earn at a new institution. An example of how this is a challenge for a place like Mills, until four years ago, all the courses at Mills were one Mills credit. All of our courses were one Mills credit. So regardless of the, if they were in our studio art program or they were a, a biochemistry um, a requirement or they were a, a, a course on urban education in the School of Education, they were all one Mills credit. It's very hard to map credit hours from other institutions onto a system that was actually set up in that way. And yet our faculty, understandably, were reluctant to let that go because they felt like that that correctly translated what was happening in their classes. And they thought they were doing something comparable in each of those different classes. Then they didn't want to drill down in, in that kind of precision. And they have done that, and they've invested in this process. But I'll tell you, it's hard to, to move an institution that's been on its own system to Carnegie credits when you haven't been in that place in the past. OK, um, these are our partners. Just a little bit about the city of Oakland, if you haven't been there lately. Um, this last year was the biggest year in construction in Oakland since the 1906 earthquakes aftermath. There were some 17 cranes up at one point in downtown Oakland, more cranes than in the city of San Francisco. Uh, Oakland is going through a tremendous boom in terms of its economy and particularly in terms of construction. Now, no boom like this lasts forever. There will be changes, but this is a significant shift for Oakland. Skyscrapers that started to go up back in 2002 that, that stalled out in the planning processes during the uh, recession of 2008, 2009, they're now being completed. Commercial office space is being occupied downtown. Many of the housing units that the Bay Area needs are being added in Oakland. Not enough to address the housing crisis. That's a real challenge still, the affordability and availability of housing. And it's a challenge that I think Mills needs to help be, meet too. But there is significant building going on. You know, in the past few years, there had been, the past decade, I think 11 jobs added in the, um, in the East Bay for every one housing unit that went in. It's just an unsustainable uh, increase in demand for housing compared to the growth of the economy. So the city of Oakland wants places like Mills to help prepare students for the economy that's out there. And the city of Oakland also wants places like Mills to thrive and survive. Small colleges um, and facing financial challenges aren't good for anybody. Everybody really wants them to succeed. We're an important employer. We're um, an important park. It's a beautiful space, an urban oasis in the neighborhood. And it's an important producer of people qualified to help lead the, the neighborhood um, and the community forward. The county of Alameda, I'll just mention that um, Oakland is a little different, say, than San Francisco. San Francisco County and city are the same. Oakland City and, and the Alameda County are distinct. And that changes schools and chartering and uh, health care provision and all sorts of particulars of local government action. So we work with Alameda County when it's appropriate. We've worked particularly with Alameda County around our public health and health equity program, one of our fastest growing new majors. Students are very interested in the social determinants of health and in the incredible disparities in healthcare outcomes across different demographic groups. And so Alameda County also cares about that and they've been working with our students to help us build a program where our students get out there on the ground with health officials from Alameda County to provide some of the services that the community wants to provide in addition to medical care. So now you see a lot of girls up here, so we're back to the girls and women. I, I do want you to know that Mills does care about that K through 12 pipeline with an eye towards gender equity. And we're not there on gender equity. The numbers in terms of pay disparity and in some of the fastest growing industries are really getting worse. We think these are the kind of programs that can help us. In particular, those that encourage women in, in STEAM or STEM, the, the science and engineering uh, programs that are fast growing. 
the tech numbers for women's representation, especially at leadership levels, are terrible, particularly for women of color. A recent study of corporate philanthropy across the tech sector showed that only one half of 1% of the philanthropy coming from foundations of the big tech industries only one half of 1% went to programs to, to uh, encourage underrepresented minorities to learn and to prosper in STEM fields. It's for whatever the, the stated imperative is, there's been very little investment there. And we've seen actually the consequences of, of this, the number of women in color in STEM uh, in, who are un, from underrepresented minorities, especially black, Latinx, and native women, has gone down by 40% in the last decade. The high watermark for women majoring in computer science was in the mid 80s. It's been declining since. The numbers are not going in the right direction. We think some of these efforts to engage women in science and engineering and, uh, and tech fields could make a difference. So these are programs that we run sometimes in the summer on our campus, sometimes during the year. There's also some of the newer partnerships that we're all investigating across higher education. You'll see the food bank up there, the Alameda County Food Bank. We have a food pantry on our campus. Many of our students suffer food insecurity, a lack of food sovereignty, whatever the label is you wanna put on that challenge, it's very real on our campuses. Well, working with the Alameda County Food Bank, we can actually leverage much more um, in terms of the donations because of the, they can buy in bulk and we can become a distribution point for the community around us um, through our food, our food pantry on the campus. So that's, a, that's an, a new and important partnership for us. Some of these others, um, the Impact Hub is a uh, hub for nonprofits in Oakland, uh, folks who serve the community. The uh, theater project there, we just renovated a theater on our campus, and Oakland uh, recently did a study of the lack of cultural equity. Community groups don't have a place to perform. We want to make sure they do have a place to perform, so we have a theater company, a local theater company that's resident on our campus this year. And then you'll see Middlebury there. Middlebury is closing out 11 years on the Mills campus where it has run language immersion programs, another way in which we can share our campus with other academic partners in a way that benefits our students and our community as well as um, our financial sustainability. So none of that is enough. Those are all things that we've been doing for some time and none of them are enough. We aren't in a, we, Mills is not in a safe place structurally in terms of the sustainability of our, um, of our uh, balance sheet. So we have to do more. And we think increasingly we need to build an economic model that relies on not only those partners that I set out, but also on other private sector partners who can help support the educational needs of our students, translate the value of a Mills education, and also broaden those revenue streams that are available to support the core expensive operation of providing a great education to students. So this is a new economic model. This is happening across small colleges, and I'm sure you've seen different versions of this. Mills has some advantages because of our location and because of our historic mission, which has been updated to reflect an uh, emphasis on racial and gender equity, and which is more relevant than ever in many of the sectors that we think are the fastest growing in terms of economic possibility. So. This is what we're looking to do, increase our sustainability both economically and environmentally. For mills to go green, we actually need partners to help us fund some of those infrastructure changes that will reduce our carbon footprint and make our community more of a model for the way in which we'd like to live into the future. We also need to be more integrated into our neighborhood. Have any of you been to the Mills College campus? Okay, you might remember going through the gates. If you, if you drove around the campus from the outside, it's sort of roughly a triangle. You wouldn't be able to see anything inside. There's big trees all the way around the outside. It's beautifully wooded inside, really lovely, and completely shut off from the outside, um, the neighborhoods that are around it in, there in Oakland. And we really are an urban campus. We're in East Oakland, a community with tremendous resources and lots of challenges, and we're not at all connected to that physically. We are connected programmatically. We have a community-engaged learning requirement as part of our core curriculum. We have many programs that, that have outreach. We have many professors who are connected, not only to schools, but to all kinds of community groups. But we think we have to be more integrated into the neighborhood in order to provide the resources that they, they deserve, but also to enhance our sustainability. The last thing is something that those of you who work in student life and academic affairs especially have certainly thought about. We know our students persist and thrive when they feel a sense of belonging. The sense of community that students feel when they're integrated into a space is at least as important as the sense of protectiveness that they feel from being disconnected from those spaces around them. We need to balance that, not have a completely secluded island in a dense uh, urban area, but instead build bridges that leverage opportunities for our students and also preserve the sense of security and opportunity that they experience right now. 
So how do you do this? The, the last few slides that I have for you here are about actually how we're trying to make this happen. So far I've painted broad brush, big pictures, this is what we should do, look how great this might be. Now I'm gonna tell you how we're trying to make this happen because we have a sense of urgency that we can't wait in order to realize a different economic model. So these are um, a few slides taken from some consultants we hired this year who have worked with other urban institutions to alter their space planning to uh, provide more value to the community and more sustainability to the institution. This is the frame that we've put on this, um, and I'll just uh, flag these for you. That, that Mills is a tremendous asset to the community, that we're well positioned to capitalize on trends in higher education and an imperative for inclusive workplaces out there, that we're suffering from a structural imbalance that is both physical and financial. So seismic, for instance, is a challenge for us. This picture with the crack in it here is from one of our historic residence halls, beautiful views up on a hill, only about 40% occupied now because it has seismic issues that make some of the building not habitable right now. And we don't have the resources to fully fund the renovation of that kind of space. And then finally, the communities around Mills are experiencing tremendous change, dramatic increases in property values, fears of gentrification, need for workforce development. Uh, all of those pieces are things that Mills and higher education can actually help with. So here's our goal, and this is a little bit hard to see, but if you can see, the Mills campus is that sort of green um, space in the center of that map with a lot of dense residential neighborhoods around us. And we think that we can approach this problem by strengthening our core, leveraging partnerships with private, public, and philanthropic groups in order to, uh, to increase the density and vibrancy of the campus, activating the edges, turning outward instead of keeping ourselves, keeping everything facing inward, and thereby anchor the community around us in East Oakland. So here's why we would do this, because we want Mills to be around another 175 years after our 175th anniversary in 2027. And right now, we don't have a full-fledged plan to reckon with all of the costs and challenges that face us. This can help us. How? By connecting these three circles, the academic enterprise that's at the core of our mission, the real estate that is a genuine uh, special asset that Mills has here in the Bay Area, and also the value of the community around us, which deserves the support of an anchor institution. We think it can not only drive resources to our academic programs, resources that we need because our students can't fully bear the cost of the education that they're working towards, um, as well as uh, staying true to what our goal has been around the community. So this is the most um, detail that I'll give you. I'd be happy to answer some more questions about it. But these, this is what we've settled on as what we think are the most likely big partners for our campus. Two economic sectors, tech and healthcare. Tech is fastest growing in the Bay Area. The most jobs have been added. It, it's not even really a narrowly defined thing. It's actually an incredibly capacious term. And it has a big problem with optics right now and substance around gender and racial equity. Not only are there one after another uh, scandals and struggles around inclusive workplaces at, at major tech companies and, and modest and startup tech companies, there's also a tremendous challenge, say, in artificial intelligence. There was an NYU report released that last month that, that talks about a diversity crisis in AI. And what is that crisis? If we're going to collect information and use it to make decisions around resource allocation and uh, economic opportunity, it needs to be inclusive and we need a workforce that actually reflects the people whose data is being collected. That is not the case in AI. Just on the gender front, not even on um, the racial um, demographics, which matter tremendously as well, the numbers are terrible in AI. The number of professors who are working in artificial intelligence it's less than 20% are women. There are very few underrepresented minorities who are leading this charge, and it's happening fast. You may have seen San Francisco just banned the facial recognition um, you know, technology in the city. It's, it's put it on the front pages of newspapers and cities around the country. This is a real concern. If that industry doesn't diversify, we think it, it won't be effective, uh, and it will have trouble with the optics that are out there. In terms of the optics, um, mentioned in my introduction, thank you, Lisa, was that I worked on this National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine study of sexual harassment in the sciences. One of the conclusions of that re report was that representation does not answer the call on this. We actually have more sexual harassment in STEM fields now, in science, engineering, and medicine, because we have more uh, women in those fields now. We have, in other words, added 
much more gender diversity in those fields, and we have not moved the needle on rates of sexual harassment. It doesn't simply work to add more women or more people of color in, in some instances in these places. We need more research about it, and we need more commitment from these companies to help us with it. So that's the, the, the tech issue is really at the center of where we think the value that could come from mills um, would help. Healthcare, it's a different value proposition. It's really that um, healthcare provision and delivery is changing. It's, it, it will be distributed differently. Hospitals and office visits are not what most innovators in healthcare are thinking about as the primary sites of care. There's more of a sense of embedded um, opportunities for multiple touches from a community healthcare provider to communities who can be reached, whose behavior can be changed. This is more patient-driven healthcare that is much more local in many respects. Mills is positioned really well to offer this. We're in an underserved, a medically underserved community in East Oakland. Very few clinics are, surround us. Very few, um, very few libraries. We actually have lots of schools and churches in the neighborhoods around us, but not many libraries and not many health clinics. So the infrastructure calculation is off, and we think Mills could help with that. Okay, so I said I would talk about how this could be implemented. I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the challenges with trying to implement this and change the model of a campus, which is not accustomed to this kind of thinking. Um, it may even seem strange to you that I'm talking about an economic model for um, something as valuable as education and the credentials and degrees that we actually offer our students the opportunity to earn. But we won't be able to continue to do that unless we come up with an economic model that works. So what are the challenges? Well, we need different administrative capacity. I didn't know I'd need to speak real estate development when I came to Mills as a college president. I also realized I need different capacity to scan the neighborhoods around us and understand what the potential is out there. That's for real, and that's different administrative capacity. We also need to make sure we're aligned with our mission. Mills is not here to be, uh, say, uh, to elevate the neighborhoods around us only. But if we can do that, support the economic development needs of the neighborhoods around us while we drive revenue to our academic programs, that's exactly the kind of thing that is mission aligned. We also have to be able to move relatively quickly. Negotiating with partners is time consuming, complex, and likely to fail. The communication around this is difficult. It's hard to talk about a potential opportunity until you actually have realized it. And initially, partners don't know enough about each other to realize whether something will work at first. That requires, um, some, uh, that, that requires some juggling around communicating and, and outreach. And finally, this adds pressure to shared governance. And since we're the provost forum, and since shared governance is important to faculty, I thought I'd focus a little more on the shared governance piece of this. So a little bit about our faculty at Mills. We have an amazing faculty. Incredibly dedicated, small liberal arts college faculty across a wide range of disciplines, committed to interdisciplinary work, um, committed to the education of their students. The Mills Next values that we put up there are about inclusive excellence, gender and racial equity, and global understanding and real world skills. Real world skills. Those are what matter to our faculty, and they do a great job. They're scholars, they're artists, they're also practitioners. They are very much engaged, um, and we have, a, we have a broad range. We've had a lot of retirements in recent years. We do have now a, a more sustainable range of junior and mid-career and senior faculty. Our faculty do work with each other. We've worked to integrate our adjuncts. For the last couple years, we've been running an adjunct inclusion initiative. Um, we have about a 50-50 balance between courses that are taught by adjuncts and courses that are taught by uh, permanent party faculty. Um, that's, a, that's a changing calculus um, that we try to keep in the right place. We want all of our programs to have the benefit of permanent party faculty and the special expertise that adjuncts can bring to, to the classroom. Uh, and we want to integrate those adjuncts into the professional development opportunities that we offer to our, our permanent party faculty too. And we've worked to be a family-friendly campus as well. All right, but there's a flip side to this. The challenges for our faculty too. When you lose people, uh, you lose a lot of corporate knowledge and a lot of experience teaching, and it really matters to the sense of belonging and the connection among faculty members when you have a large number of retirements. We also have students, as many of us are finding across higher education, that come to us with a range of needs that are broader than what we used to experience in the past. The most prominent place we see this are in mental health needs and the demands of our students for adequate support for their mental health needs. That's different, and faculty are at the front edge of that in many ways because they see students often and because they don't always have all the tools that they should in order to help students respond. 
when you hire new faculty, this is retiring faculty with me last year, hiring new faculty is great and no one lands completely prepared to succeed. And we need to help. We need to provide some wraparound support and we need to provide that orientation and onboarding that's not a one-time effort and not something we can do online. So that's a genuine investment that the institution has to make in that changing faculty. You all know too, um, what students expect in terms of digital access to us, the kind of tools we need to use, they continue to change. The cost of searches, you know, the investment that our faculty spend in, in hiring new faculty and finding the right people is tremendous. That's, uh, that's not often recognized as the real labor that's going into maintaining academic programs, and it's real. It's so exciting to bring on new colleagues, and it's a tremendous amount of work, and it's a lot of sense of loss sometimes, too. We don't always land the candidates that we most invest in. Um, we, it's a competitive marketplace out there for faculty, and that makes a big difference. So some of the challenges uh, also run to dollars and cents. Uh, the, the salaries that we pay and the benefits that we offer are not equivalent to those at some other institutions, especially with the high cost of living in the Bay Area. This creates stress and challenges. Our faculty is about 40% faculty of color, about 70% women. We have people who are really committed to Mill's mission, and yet it's tough for us to hang on to them, given the pressures of the Bay Area housing situation and more. That last piece, um, pressures on faculty assessment and evaluation, I just want to flag that for you to say that it's not clear that we've been evaluating faculty in the ways that make sense given the changing demands on the faculty that we have at a small college like Mills. One example that affects all of us is, for instance, what the weight we've been giving to teaching evaluations. Are teaching evaluations actually a meaningful arbiter of quality for faculty? Uh, should we be looking at them in the ways that we are? Should we be correcting, as some institutions are now, for racial and gender uh, uh, disruptions in the patterns that we know result from student ratings of faculty? This is a big challenge for us. What about the extensive service requirements that we ask of faculty when our institutional models are changing like this? I've asked, I, I think it's six faculty to participate on calls over the summer with me. Every couple weeks, I'm gonna talk to them about the campus optimization process, about the partners that we're considering, about the building analysis that we've done, about the neighborhood scans. I want them to be in the loop and helping us consider this. But they're not on 12-month contracts. You know, they're, they're answering the phone in the summer when they would be doing other things. So shared governance imposes stress on our faculty too and, and, and us as administrators to figure out how to balance that, asking more of them and participating in these decisions and this analysis of options. At the same time, we recognize the many demands that, um, that they're already uh, struggling to manage. Okay, so I had to put another picture of Captain Marvel up so we don't lose it all together. Um, I just wanted to, to come back to this idea. So Captain Marvel is realized as superhero when Captain Marvel remembers her past as an intrepid girl who was undaunted by any obstacle that came before her and, um, and is able to overcome some of the brainwashing, as I would use my military history um, background to say, the brainwashing that had happened um, in her current incarnation, she turns superhero when she connects that past to the future. I think that's what women's colleges need to do. And I think it's what small liberal arts colleges need to do, and probably the higher ed sector more generally, but I'm no expert on all of that. I just know that we can actually do this uh, because the gender and racial equity issue is not only about optics, it's actually about the very center of what we do. And higher ed has not always been on the force of righteousness in moving us towards greater equity. We are the source of inequity as well. And I think uh, recognizing that and putting ourselves more out there as part of the answer is an important part of finding this economic model that we're looking for. I also want to say space matters tremendously. You've all probably experienced your office moving. Maybe you weren't happy about that. Maybe you were thrilled. Um, turf, um, space, people attached to the locations that they're in, it really matters to people. And we're talking about changing, disrupting our space in tremendous ways. I don't think Mills campus can look the same way in 10 or 20 years to meet the educational needs of our students into the future. I think that it has to change. I don't think we can afford to not build housing on some of the land that we have, given the incredible demand for housing in the Bay Area, including in sectors of the economy that we're especially interested in, healthcare, teachers, um, our staff and faculty, all of, all of the people that we need to do this human capital intensive thing of, of educating people. I also think that we need to consider new approaches to governance and administration. In the last year, we created at Mills a new vice president position. Of course, I can't really add people to the college officer team, so I had to take one away and um, put this one in instead, but we added a vice president for strategic partnerships. 
I think we need people to actually lead the engagement efforts around this that are different administrative tools and capacity and portfolio than what we've had in the past. And um, I think we're going to need to ask for grace from our stakeholders and from our community as we figure out what the right combination is as, as we do this, because we're not going to be right every time. Um, on the shared governance part, I think that we are asking faculty to change with us at a time when we're having to change very fast. Most of our faculty didn't join us because they were keen on changing into something that they didn't sign up to. They signed up to do something they intended to do when they came to our institutions. And they understandably are holding us accountable for that change that they're um, enduring, suffering, celebrating through. I mean, it really depends. There's not one set of responses to these changes. But I think that we'll have to keep thinking about how both administration and shared governance engaging our faculty, building new programs, identifying partners, and changing the physical space that we're in actually sets the, the path forward for women's colleges to thrive, but also for other kinds of institutions too. Okay, so that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, I'd be happy to take questions if I'm allowed. So. Sure, yeah, yes, yes, yes. There's a mic over there for you so that folks can hear it. It's coming. So you use the term anchor institution, and I, most of the instances of universities talking about that that I've read about are bigger universities than, than Mills. So what, what's that look like for you when you think about that? What are you, what's the content of that piece? So you've hit the main question, and that is, can I work with consultants who have largely worked with larger urban institutions with deeper resources and a much bigger presence already in their communities to do something similar um, when we have a small college like Mills without the, the same capacity? Um, so uh, I think what it looks like is that the metrics that I put out there, that we strengthen the core. In other words, we identify where's the center of the campus in terms of our academic programs, and what do we need to preserve in order to preserve who Mills is. And then leverage partnerships means we identify others who can use underutilized space on our campus. Our residence halls are not fully subscribed. Our, our academic classrooms are not full. Our, um, our, uh, our uh, performing arts facilities are not fully subscribed. Our big grassy areas where uh, there are 500 kids right outside my office today. When we were leaving, there was uh, 500 students out there for this World Savvy program. Great, that happens sometimes, but not every day. So we need to use those green spaces. We have a farm, we have a community farm. I don't have enough people who are visiting our community farm. There's an orchard, there are bees, there are flowers that we sell at a farmer's market every week. There's um, sustainable agricultural methods that are being taught there. Our students are fixing irrigation tape um, as well as dealing with the gophers, which is a different set of opportunities to learn there. You know, all those all those pieces actually they're coming right there in the middle of Oakland but we aren't using those we aren't leveraging uh, the assets of the physical assets of the campus sufficiently yet so I think bringing in other partners matters a lot we added a performing arts facilities director this time this year after we renovated a theater on the campus it was closed for a year as we renovated it we added a facilities director to do more outreach to the community organizations bring in a resident theater company bring in a resident dance group to start to create more energy and vitality around that Leveraging partnerships also means some of the buildings on the campus that we likely can't afford to fully renovate and realize and add the tech infrastructure that we need down the road. We need partners to help us share those costs, and that means we need to share uses with those partners. One example, we have these amazing residence halls that look like the dining halls look a little bit like Hogwarts um, dining hall. You know, these um, big, wood, expansive, major kitchens attached next to them. The kitchens actually aren't used anymore because like virtually every small institution, we centralized dining years ago because it was too expensive to run dining facilities in each of the different residence halls on the campus. But now they're not used, those spaces, and, and the... Um, the dining halls, while beautiful, are inaccessible. So the combination of seismic needs, ADA, uh, accessibility, um, deferred maintenance, and underutilization means that we have space to invite other people to our campus, and we think that will help with uh, leveraging partnerships. And in terms of what it means around the edges of the campus to activate the edges of the campus, I think everything that we build needs to have an academic component and, and function and use at its core, but it can be used for other things too. And around our campus, starting to turn outward and not have all the doors on the inside of the campus, but some that are facing outward, changing the traffic patterns around the campus, altering the campus's relationship to the community, I, I think that's what it means. 
And I don't see why a place with the philanthropic and community resources of the Bay Area, especially Oakland with where it is right now, can't do that the way that larger institutions can do. We can't fund it all ourselves, but really large institutions don't fund it all themselves either. They're working with public-private partnerships or P4, public-private philanthropic partnerships, in order to create that capacity. And I think that we're really limited by the size of the vision that we put out there. Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned the importance of building partners and partnerships. Uh, were any lessons learned uh, from the Mil Middlebury experience, and how are you going to build on that since they've abandoned you, apparently? Um, you know, they're, they're heading back home to Vermont, which we understand, so I wouldn't, and, um, they, I wouldn't say they abandoned us. I'm happy they were with us for 11 years, and it's been a great ride for us. Um, when I first came to Mills and Middlebury was there in the summer, to be honest, it's a little odd. It feels like the campus is occupied by um, an outside force um, during the weeks where the language immersion programs are happening because they take all the common spaces up and you, you, you aren't to speak, uh, you know, certainly aren't to speak English, but you're not really to speak any language but for the languages they're teaching on the campus. Most of us usually lapse into some other language, um, you know, to, um, to try to accommodate that. But it's, it, it has been not always the easiest of fit, I'll say. But but it's been great for our community to have that. Middlebury has had a year-round presence on our campus, so we learned that some of our partners, even if they're only with us in the summer, actually have a need for office space and coordination and uh, administrative work throughout the year, so we learned about that. We also renegotiated our contract with them multiple times, and we kept in touch with where they were. A couple years ago, when we realized that we were up for renewal and we were all considering our economic models and what would happen next, we shared where we were and kept open lines of communication. So that helped us in terms of knowing that this would be happening and what might be possible. All those partners, TechBridge Girls, um, the, uh, the Go Girls, all those different partners, we couldn't have them on our campus um, in this, the summer after Middlebury leaves if Middlebury was still with us because of the number of spaces, academic and residential, that Middlebury takes up for us. Um, I think also we learned that it's a great stress on our staff to manage the academic year program and immediately flip everything over to a summer program with very different needs. For instance, our library staff. They, they met the research demands of three language uh, programs that were happening on our campus um, just a couple of weeks after the commencement ended and they had just finished that, the, the, the work for the academic year essentially for the core Mills programs. So I think we, we don't want to underestimate the challenge of the administrative structure and the agility that we ask of our, our core staff when we deal with different kinds of partners. And some things just lift the whole campus. An example would be the largest of the language schools is the Arabic school um, with hundreds of students and uh, um, uh, many dozen faculty who would come to teach Arabic. They do a banquet every year that's just a marquee event. And our housing and dining facilities folks and our tech people who come out and the music department people who worry about the practice rooms and the pianos and how Middlebury, Middlebury is using all those things in the summer, that's been a great way to create community around our campus in the summer too with this amazing um, uh, banquet that they would put on for everybody at Mills um, once a year. So we'll miss a lot of things about Middlebury, but I hope we'll be able to leverage what they brought to us. And they're still going to give scholarships to our students, which we're happy about, because uh, part of the challenges of being a small college committed to the liberal arts is that we can't offer all the language programs that we'd like to. And Middlebury offering scholarships to our students creates more opportunities for our students to experience um, in this particular kind of intensive language instruction, too. Yes. So, um, I, I'm curious about how you see um, the demographics of your student body interacting with this this change and this outward looking at Mills and how how they both serve the same need and how this sort of enhances the inclusion types of things that you you've been talking about. Um, it's something we're certainly concerned about, and I don't think there will be one reaction by um, students. I think students will have a variety of different reactions to this. One of the reasons people are drawn to Mills right now is its um, quiet oasis feel. There aren't, there, it is uh, lots of green space and not that many people and um, a place for people to feel a sense of refuge and take academic risks, for instance, that they might not otherwise take. This could change that dynamic. And for students who came to us specifically for that reason, I think that it behooves us to make sure we protect their interests as best we can, but I also think they'll be challenged by some of the changes that we're talking about. My hope is that the, 
change process, the arc will be long enough that we'll be able to communicate sufficiently around us. Much as I'd like to have a thriving economic model up and ready on July 1st for the new fiscal year, that's not how these things go. It will take us some time. So I think we'll have time to communicate with our students around it. And others, some of whom, some, some students who we don't retain uh, and who aren't successful leave because it's too quiet for them and they have a different set of expectations around the campus. And I think that for many who are, who have that sense and who also want us to be more connected to Oakland, I think that will matter. I think we're for we're more assertively reaching out into the Oakland community than we used to do, um, and and that's in terms of the local government connections that we're making, in terms of the community organizations that we're visiting, and in terms of the uh, neighborhood initiatives that we're supporting. And I think that could help us too in terms of connecting programs to the physical use of space. Right behind tonight. I think I can talk a lot. Um, I'm a product of girls' schools and a women's college back east. And I was just thinking, and they were parochial Catholic. And what the nuns used to do when they ran into trouble and when people weren't going, women weren't going, people, women weren't going into the orders anymore, they would just sell off these beautiful properties. They said they had a tremendous amount of real estate, often in the nicest, on ocean fronts and everything else. Now they're doing more. I know my own college in Boston, undergrad institution, is partnering with like Lilly Labs. They're doing the tech and... Um, the health uh, partnerships. You mentioned something really interesting about housing and building housing. Do you have your personal preference, if you could have a personal preference, the balance between public and private um, investments and partnerships? Do you see them in any direction? Which, which would be more, which would be less, which would be useful? I'm just thinking the whole notion of housing is fascinating. Uh, would it be housing for the community, just for males people, or how do you view that? Mm. The short answer is I don't know, um, and as opportunities uh, mature, we'll have a better sense of what our choices are along those lines. Um, but the potential to provide public good through the work that we're doing is something that matters to our enrollment potential and to our academic programs as well as to our financial sustainability. So I wouldn't um, want to pivot towards, uh, and, and, and honestly, the affordable housing imperative means that no one builds housing um, in the Bay Area without, um, without setting aside an important part which we'd like to exceed should we be able to finance it appropriately, you know, enough of that. But the costs of construction are really high right now. It, again, there are cycles to this, but the uh, but most don't predict a significant decrease in the cost of construction. So we have to find a sustainable way to build. And right now, um, notwithstanding the great efforts of the philanthropic foundations out there that are putting some money into affordable housing, the extent of the housing that we need, the numbers, you know, writ large, it's so big that we have to have private sector solutions too. But I think public funding can help with that. For instance, teacher housing. You know, K through 12 is in some crisis right now, and it's driven not in small part by the difficulty of retaining teachers whose salaries don't enable them to match the Bay Area housing market demands. And should we, we, we can, I think, secure funding from the state of California, potentially for housing to meet those educational needs in K through 12. And at the same time, it would drive potential students to our School of Education and the, the opportunities there to our grant-funded Mills Teacher Scholar programs. And so that could, could could make Mills more of a hub for those kinds of efforts too. So I think it will be a balance of those different pieces. Thanks. First, thank you so much. I'm interested in how you're working with the faculty, both those who've been there for a while and those who are coming on, since you're at a point, an inflection point of great change. And how are you getting them to not only be comfortable with, but be creative and inspired by that? So I'm not sure that I am um, getting them to be creative and inspired just yet because um, they they um, because we've asked them to do so many other things, honestly. And I think actually I need to offer them something that is a genuine uh, sustainability plan with real partnership opportunities to start with to generate that kind of excitement and opportunity. I'd say the most effective way that we've gotten people excited so far is to have a physical model of the campus. This sounds like a gimmick, but I'll tell you, it made a big difference. We haven't had a physical model of our campus. We have a lot of aerial views, one of which you saw there, that show the campus, but they make it flat and they make it look uh, you know, uh, undifferentiated. And actually getting as part of our campus optimization process a physical model of the campus, it opened people's eyes to the amount of space that we have. We have 135 acres, um, 65 buildings, average age is about 65 years. We have, we have, a lot, but we, we have lots of available space, uh, the amount of square uh, feet we have per student is incredibly high. So we actually have much more space, and I think that it has helped 
uh, open people's uh, eyes about what we might be able to do when they realize it doesn't mean we're taking this meadow or eliminating this building or this program, but instead we're looking to to build on developable land that's around the campus and actually increase the um, the functionality of some of the spaces on the campus itself. I also think some of it is about relationships and trust as ever. So I try to keep listening to the faculty who are out there. Our provost office does that as well. Our provost is critical in all these faculty outreach efforts. And we're trying to update the governance models. We have a faculty handbook that was recently updated, but like most faculty handbooks, it's really long and unwieldy, and most people don't know all the details of it, except for the people who know every detail of it and visit me regularly. You know, so there's, there's a lot of challenges around trying to um, make sure we meet the processes that are set out and that we actually do things that are rational moving forward. So I don't know, that's not a very complete answer, but it's how we're trying. So uh, also, thank you very much for just a wonderful talk, a lot of food for thought. And just to build a little bit on your question, uh, I'm curious, uh, a lot of what you're talking about, in my impression, is it's very innovative. It's, it's about bringing together the, the financial needs with the programming, the school programming. And then the other piece, of course, is the faculty who you mentioned have been um, having perhaps more burdens than have been the case. And I'm curious if there is also a rethinking about, um, you know, promotion qual you know, what it means to be a professor in, and not just at Mills, but it seems to me that you're on the leading edge of kind of thinking about what it mean what public engagement means for university systems more generally and what it means to reward university systems or faculty who are actually engaged publicly because that's actually what, it seems to me that's what you're talking about and that's the other piece of it. So I'm curious about how, you talked about the faculty handbook, how that is deep baked into kind of inspiring faculty through a recognition of what they can bring in this innovative rethinking of what a university can do. So we're in conversation right now with our appointments, promotion, and tenure committee around what the standards are that they're setting out and how that should work. Um, Mills hasn't had a general salary increase for uh, just about a decade. Um, you know, our, our faculty, the, their cost of living, the cost of living has outpaced our ability to increase compensation across the college. Um, that's that's a big challenge, and it means that. Um, some of the expectations that are out there are, are called into question by sheer scarcity, um, not only by those additional duties that we talked about. So we're talking about what the, the standards should be. Most of the standards are written in a way that they, they can be applied, um, that different outcomes can result from the application of the same standards. So there's discretion that's baked into academic decision making that we all expect and we count on professional, um, professional faculty to actually enforce and interpret. And yet there is a real question about whether we should do that, whether we should make more significant changes in what the standards are. Um, Next year, we're, we've already started this process with doing some surveys of our faculty and finding out what matters most to them. It's not consistent across departments. The thing that is causing the pressure for our public policy faculty who have the most advisees is not the same thing that's causing the pressure for um, the biology faculty that's facing resource constraints and, um, and, and lab opportunities. Or you know, It's different across different spaces. But it's, uh, we're asking more questions around that. And next year, we're engaging in the Harvard program. It's um, called COACH with an E on the end of it, which is, uh, yes, yeah, so you've done that. So, so this is an effort for us to provide the resources to understand what, what, um, what, how we can help our faculty manage this time, which can include, as you suggest, a change in what counts and how we count it. So I just have a question. It's, you know, I think about Mills College and understand I've studied women's colleges, but I've also studied historically black colleges and universities. And when I think about the, I draw a parallel between the enrollment of Mills, the things that you are trying to do, uh, and I think about what's happening in the South, especially with the declining enrollment at historically black colleges and universities. And you go on those campuses and you have conversations with administrators, faculty, staff, students, and others, and think about trying to be innovative to keep these institutions really going and thriving. And I continue to hear where we are no longer staying true to our mission. And so how are, I'm not sure if that's something that you're facing as president of Mills, but how are you dealing with the kind of, I mean, I felt like I walked in the room and I talked about doing all these things and, and people were going to uh, probably just, I don't, 
it was just a hor- uh, not a horrible experience, but just like, I dare you to come in here and say that we want to bring people on our campus and we want to, you know, create all these different things and bring outsiders because this is not, you know, we're not staying true to our mission. And if you want to come here and you work here, you need to understand who we are. Well put. Um, there's, um, there is a parallel. It's interesting. Um, you know, in California, there's tremendous demand for higher education, and there are some record applications to institutions like UC Davis and others, and yet we're suffering declining enrollment and declining interest, which is similar to the South. You know, the South is the only part of the country where institutions largely met their enrollment projections by May 1st. Um, everybody else is, is uh, underwater, essentially, um, at, at, among independent colleges and universities, and yet HBCUs in the South are struggling um, with enrollment challenges. The UNCF just came out with a study, too, about how HBCUs are unfairly targeted in the accreditation process, subjected to additional scrutiny and additional uh, measures that make them more likely to suffer um, reputational decline and then enrollment decline as a result of that scrutiny that's not about around academics most often, but it's around finances. I think we're all um, in that place in, uh, among small colleges. I think that it's a long arc to people realizing that institutions have to change. And I think that it sometimes takes multiple generations of leaders to actually change the feel of a campus and really reckon with the situation that you find yourself in. Sometimes we're victims of our own resilience. If you've managed to deal with deficits and enrollment shortfalls and all kind of challenges over the years, then people get inured to the idea that actually you can't manage that over the long term. If you haven't fully funded deferred maintenance for decades, why start now? Um, <laughs> and, and so I, I think that it's, um, I felt often as a, a new college president when I came to Mills, um, what seems like an eternity or a heartbeat ago, depending on how I'm thinking that day, I thought it was like, I feel like it's a dawn of understanding. It's taken me a long time to sort of understand things and to see the terrain, and I continue to see more over time, and I certainly don't have all the answers yet, and I don't know that any one person ever could. I think that actually trying to respect the passion for the institution that people who have that objection come, come to you with and, um, and listen uh, and say, I agree, we do want to continue to stay true to our mission and we can't continue to do this. One of the things we tried to do at Mills when I first got there was to talk about a culture of scarcity and a deficit culture and how damaging that is. You know, when you tell people that they, this is their budget, but please don't spend that much because we probably won't have that much at the end of the year. And actually we don't really quite have that much anyway. And so we have to get 15% of our operating budgets by the end of the year. So please don't, you know, people can't actually spend um, in, in ways that um, protect the long-term health of the institution and they can't help their students prosper. Uh, and we can't just keep asking people to take on more, you know, a bigger and bigger portfolio of responsibilities. So that when you, I think when you say, I know this has been hard, it actually, it, it it's never going to be easy to do this kind of work in higher education. We need mission-driven people, but it doesn't always have to be, uh, you know, Herculean, heroic efforts in order to, to do this. We need to change the model that we're funding this through, and it's possible for us to do it, but we really can't do it by ourselves. I don't know, I also, I think that sometimes we're just gonna fail in, in translating that. And I think it's not about the words that you say and it's not about your own commitment or your understanding or your capacity to listen, but it's just about the time that you have the conversation and all these other factors that you can't control. Um, sorry, if I may, uh, quickly. Uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. Um, one of the things that really interested me was to hear the perspective from a liberal arts institution. And I was wondering, because um, I didn't hear you talk a lot about kind of curricular content. Uh, you, I think you referred to a core curriculum at one point. I was curious to hear your perspective on kind of the changing vision of the liberal arts and particularly how it intersects uh, technologically driven online uh, coursework and content. So we have not done a tremendous amount in online program development. We have a growing number of hybrid courses, as most of us do, and more emphasis on flex, greater flexibility and, and resilience for climate and other reasons through um, you know, remote learning opportunities. But we only have one fully online degree program right now. That's in our School of Education. It's a master's in educational leadership. We're in our first year of that. It's been a great learning opportunity for us um, to work with the partners who have helped us build that out. So. I, um, it's hard to hit your targets for enrollment and for the, um, uh, and uh, maintain the high quality and the cost estimates that you put out there for some of those. That's been our experience with this one, one online program development opportunity that we've had. I do think that our faculty came to grips before I came to Mills with a change in the orientation of our uh, liberal arts curriculum with the core curriculum revisions that they made. 
and they did elevate some of the things that make Mills what it is with a, um, uh, a particular uh, requirement for race and gender justice uh, education and a community engaged learning requirement. We did adopt some of those um, requirements before we were fully prepared to fulfill them all the way across the curriculum, and so that's been a growth process to actually to undertake that. I think there is a widespread understanding across our faculty that our students care about the opportunities that await them when they master certain subject areas and meet the requirements for particular majors, and so our faculty have, um, have worked to sometimes streamline majors um, to create more interdisciplinary, more interdisciplinary and more flexible majors that count different parts of the um, we, we have fixed some of the things that are sort of like what I call that Mills credit, that one unit for every Mills course. Some of those things were things we just needed to shift. And I think that curricular conversation is really never done. So uh, while we did that some years ago, probably it's long enough ago that we need to start doing it again. But I didn't say that, so. Thank you. Uh, I am very interested for um, to know what, if you could project, what the campus will look like in 10 to 20 years. Will those green spaces remain? Will there be infill? What will the new traffic pattern look like? Will those, you know, geogra or physical and perhaps virtual walls around the community have holes? <laughs> <laughs> What, it, what does it look like in your, in your vision? I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think we'll have holes. We may have openings. Um, I don't think we'll um, have infill, infill, but we'll ha have uh, more functional space. I don't think we'll eliminate the green, but we may move it um, to the tops of um, uh, spaces. I, I think that we'll have trees, but maybe not the same kind. We have two or 3,000 eucalyptus trees among the 10,000 trees on our campus. Uh, we uh, shut down classes for four days last November because of smoke. Um, and that's the second year in a row that smoke impacted our campus in ways that it hadn't in Oakland since 1991, when the fires were in Oakland in 1991. And Mills was the next place to be evacuated had the, um, the fires not stopped and the ash and the, um, the threat uh, abated when it did. I think that the environmental sustainability piece of this is really going to figure tremendously. And our community wants us to do that too. In terms of the details, I don't know. You know, I'm not a real estate developer, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer, and I am not the arbiter of all things programmatic at Mills either. I think it'll be interesting to see how it turns out. I think we, it will be more multifarious than what it is right now and less secluded. But other than that, I think it's tough to say. Thank you. I have a curricular question as well. So towards the end of your talk, you were, you were um, emphasizing health and tech industries as places where you want the university to go. How does that mesh with the history of the college, with the emphasis on liberal arts? Are you thinking of some creative interdisciplinary kinds of degrees that still emphasize liberal arts, but also lend themselves to health and tech industry? Or, or what is your vision there? Well, we think our real superpower is the liberal arts. We just can't always front with that message because it's not what people are seeking to um, to acquire as much right now. But I don't think the tech or the um, education preparation to be a teacher, tech education preparation to be a teacher, preparation to be a healthcare professional, that any of those will be successful as successful as they might be without that core breadth and depth that comes with the liberal arts education. So, and I think our faculty will make sure that we continue to um, to. Uh, to staff sufficiently and to be creative and uh, forward-looking enough in those areas too. I think it could create, you know, different opportunities depending on what faculty we're interested in. You know, healthcare is such a big thing now. There's really a lot of ways to think about that: music therapy, art therapy, healthcare administration, um, the uh, the impact of the arts um, in this in in healthcare outcomes and in disparities. Actually, it seems to be really big. Same thing with the environmental spaces on the campus and the impact of different spaces. If you listen to the UCSF uh, CEOs talk about the new hospitals that they're building, it is a completely different physical environment that they're creating to improve health outcomes and shorten recovery times, for instance. And I think we'll need those kinds of spaces that will be informed by, uh, by what liberal arts scholars, uh, arts and humanities, uh, social sciences bring to the table too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, 
Uh, I don't. I don't think I can no project. project. Just for oh, the recording okay. purposes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't want to miss on the microphone. Parent of a current Mills student, so I did hear <laughs> yeah. that. So thank you. So we're, you know, one of the things that bothers us when we come to visit our daughter in Mills is how in, how closed off it is to the rest of the community, and one of the things that we struggle with is, you know, it's not integrated into the community around, you know, around Mills and their ways to do it. So has there been resistance to doing that before? How are you planning to overcome that resistance? You know, because you'll get resistance from the parents as well, you know. Um, and what's your vision for that? And have there been some attempts to address that issue? I'd love for your help with addressing that issue. I think that um, uh, it actually really makes a difference when stakeholders um, uh, talk about this themselves and what might be possible if there is a change in the in the physical, um, uh, you know, presence and connections within the campus. Uh, there has been there is resistance to virtually everything that we seek to do. For a while, for a while, I thought that at, at Mills, um, everything that I did, people said you're doing this instead of going co-ed. Because anytime new leadership comes to a women's college, there's questions: Are you going to stay a women's college, or are you going to not be a women's college anymore? Because most women's colleges, historically, women's colleges are no longer women's colleges. The bottom line is actually the enrollment numbers for still women's colleges and used to be women's colleges, they're pretty much the same. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't have different and maybe more students if we were to open to all genders. On the other hand, I'm not sure. That's, it's actually not a recipe for automatic success to change such a fundamental part of uh, an institutional mission as that has been. Not to say that it's been the wrong decision for many institutions. I wouldn't pretend to know that. So I, I think that there will be challenge around making some of these changes. I hope that they'd be you know, sequenced and, and discussed and then revised and refined in ways that allow us to um, respond, if not completely, at least partly to the concerns of parents and others in the community who are, are concerned about it. And right now, there's a, one project is happening right now which is a real challenge for the campus. There's a construction project right outside our front gate because of uh, um, a streetscape improvement, um, multi-month construction effort that has completely messed up traffic patterns and created lots of backups and challenges on the campus. But it will add 60 trees and another uh, traffic light and new bus stops and uh, bike paths and wider sidewalks and a lot of improvement that we actually need for the safety of not only um, our students right outside the front gate, but actually members of the community who are around us. And it was a Mills public policy student who conceived of that some 15 years ago now. You know, the sad thing about the pace of change is that 15 years ago, this need was very powerful, and it's every bit as strong right now, and it's finally happening because uh, part of the funding was secured. So I think that, that that's an example of how we want to do that connection. I hope we can use the success of that project to make people feel excited about the potential for doing that in other parts of the campus, too. Thank you.